pretty much all my art, it is very autobiographical in the sense that it is capturing something I'm working through internally. And then I see it as it's an excavation process or um, a term that I played around with last year was a deep sea pearl diver. So diving in the depths of my psyche, going to the really, really dark places, um, seeing what comes up and then being able to share what comes up with other people. Hey everyone, how's it going? This is your host Yoshino, and you are listening to episode number 130 of Artist Decoded. And I'm here with JDH, Justin Dosher Hopkins, who is the co-host of Artist Decoded. And how's it going, man? How are you? It's good. A uh, long time no see. Back from my sabbatical. <laughs> <laughs> Radical sabbatical. Radical sabbatical. Back like Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so how was, how was this interview with uh, Yumi Sakagawa? It was great. I was familiar with Yumi because of her books and comic zines. And I met her through my wife, Asia, who hosts regular workshops at the house. And she was lucky enough to have Yumi come through and host a meditation workshop. And her work is very much tied to meditation and the subconscious and unconscious kind of way of thinking. And um, she's got like hyper imaginative work and it was really nice catching up with Yumi and hearing about a lot of her background, things I wasn't really aware of before. Her upbringing coming up as a uh, Japanese or woman Japanese-American artist has its own set of trials and tribulations and growing up in a, as an Americanized Japanese person in a Japanese home and the education friction there. It was interesting and it all plays into what, what she is now and how she became who she is and the kind of context that she speaks to in her work. So I hope you enjoy the podcast. It was a fun conversation for me. Okay, so I hope you enjoy the episode. If you'd like to, please go to our iTunes page and leave us a review. It'll help for viewers just like yourself to hear about this podcast. So here it is, episode number 130 with artist Yumi Sakugawa, interviewed by Justin Dosher Hopkins. Justin. <laughs> Thank you for joining me here today. Um, it is a bit rainy, so if the listeners hear a little bit of excess noise in the background, that's what that is. A rare, maybe increasingly less rare rainy day in Los Angeles. Um, so what what brings you here today, aside from me asking you? Like, <laughs> bring me from the point of origin, i.e. birth of Yumi, to now. How did you get here? Oh, I love this question. Um, well... I was born in Orange, California. Mm. My parents met in Southern California. They both respectively moved from Japan to Southern California in their own very different ways. My father came to study at UC Irvine. And my mom, she tagged along on a local church trip to travel through America and when she stopped at Southern California she was just so struck by how beautiful the weather was that she just decided not to leave. <laughs> yeah, it's a common trap. <laughs> totally. And and from there growing up in Orange County, I was a very shy introverted kid, so I drew a lot, I wrote a lot and I went to school at UCLA to study art and very serendipitously, I discovered meditation, and for the last 10 plus years, I've been meditating a lot and making comics about them, which has led to published books and this ongoing journey of um, thinking a lot about relationships, meditation, spirituality, and how to condense that and express that for other people to understand, while also exploring my own healing process. Yeah, I mean... That actually sums up a lot of the questions I was going to get to. <laughs> but I guess we can start with, um, did you consider yourself more of a writer, artist, 
um, I guess the spiritual aspect came a bit later. Mm-hmm. But um, did you were you more drawn to one versus the other um, predominantly first, and then they kind of had that kind of marriage later, or, or were you constantly doing it at the same time? I think I was constantly doing it at the same time, and it was actually a weird source of turmoil for me in the sense that I I think as a kid growing up in the 90s I don't know if it's different now but I feel like no one ever tells you that you could do multiple things when you become an adult um, that you could have multiple careers multiple phases do different things at once and so I had this weird pressure on myself that I had to choose between <laughs> writing and drawing and so I think it fluctuated over the years where I think primarily I got into drawing as a kid and then I discovered creative writing and I, I want to say growing up I really thought I was going to be a fiction writer but then I ended up studying art in college But then I was also in a theater group in college and writing scripts and one act scenes. And so I felt like I always had this push and pull between those two polarities. And it really wasn't until the end of college where as I was getting more and more into indie comics, the very obvious solution suddenly came to me like, oh, I could do both. (laughs) And I I think even... Now, there is still that push and pull where I have phases where I am making a lot of visual work. And I feel like right now I'm going through a phase where I'm actually doing a lot of writing. So I think that tension never is going to quite go away. But I think it's a product. Now I realize that it's a productive tension that creates interesting work. Yeah, I've been dealing with that same exact thing my whole life. And I've kind of made it my mission to prove that you can be, you can excel at multiple things and, or at least try to, and that there, there's not really a lot different. I mean, fundamentally they're different as in like the physical aspect of attaching your brain to your hand and creating a two dimensional object for communication versus writing, which is different way of holding information, but still same kind of expression of a similar idea. I think I don't I don't necessarily see the difference in the medium but but a lot of people do which is kind of I always thought kind of strange that you needed to pick a lane. I think it's only in the last I feel like fairly recently that people are coming around to the idea of polymaths and the idea that you can be several different things at the same time and not the whole jack of all trades master of none thing. It seems like kind of like a an old like a passé way of thinking. But um, that's interesting that you you felt like you needed to pick one or the other. How do you how do you express that tension in your work? So I made a experimental zine for my recent art show opening at Judson Studios East, and it was a text based zine. It was all text, no drawings or visuals, which is very different from what I usually do. And so just playing around with typography and the composition of typography and words, it made me realize that text-based work is its own visual language in how you compose the text, how you place the text on a page, uh, the sequential order of different text sizes. And so then the binary between text and visual doesn't matter Um because they're so intertwined and I feel like that's a new that's a new phase that I'll be exploring in future works. Have you completely left the theatrical side of your world as well or is that is that something that you're still living in a bit? I think I'm still living in it in the sense that uh, sometimes I do guided meditation workshops and sometimes I lead guided meditations for public events and so that was just a very unexpected way where my theater background played itself out in my future works, where I found that having a theater background was very useful for me, but in this completely unexpected way. You said you were an introverted kid growing up, and that makes sense with the drawing and the writing and everything seems like a very um, solitary work. But then the theatrical side of it, was that in some kind of way 
and um, and public speaking as well. Is that some kind of way of overcoming that early stage of your life, or is it? It was it just a was it a natural progression as you grew up that it wasn't as scary as it was when you were young? Um, I think both. Um, I think it was both a conscious decision of not wanting to be so introverted and not speaking up and challenging myself out of a comfort zone in addition to, I think, a very slow evolution of slowly giving myself permission to open myself up to the world more and more. Do you think uh, that you were naturally an introvert or that was um, subject to your environment? I guess, well, (laughs) this is such a trendy word that's thrown around now, but I guess I'm an ambivert. An ambivert, (laughs) which means what? I'm not not familiar with that word. Um, I think I, well, I guess, I guess the word ambivert is the idea that you're both an introvert and an extrovert. Um, I guess like being bisexual, but for introvert, extrovert. Or like ambidextrous, yeah. <laughs> ambidextrous, that's yeah. a better one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, or or I, I feel like people are just throwing around different terms these days, like ambivert, or, or I'm an introverted extrovert, or I'm an ex- extroverted introvert, because I feel like people are finally realizing, like you said, with the polymath, that the binary of A or B is just not working for people anymore collectively. And so I feel like I'm an extroverted introvert. That's my answer for right this moment. <laughs> I feel like those kinds of words are so like not very useful anymore. I feel like I, if, if you, cause I always felt like I was introvert growing up and then was suddenly an extrovert or not even really an extrovert because people say that like, you know, introvert is people who regain their energy or whatever from being alone or, but there's also that stigma about being shy. And, um, I, I feel like it's, it's not a very useful identity to force on yourself. I mean, if you consider yourself an extra introvert, I feel like you will inherently start going that direction and being more self-conscious and then leading your way, a self away from quote unquote extroverted tendencies. When I feel like mostly it's just about people becoming comfortable with themselves and the more comfortable you are with yourself, the more you can share it with other people in a healthy way. And I don't feel like that has too much to do with how you gain or like receive energy. But, but I think I feel like those, those old definitions have just held on for too long. <laughs> like the binary way of thinking is, is kind of seeming nonsensical to a lot of people. Maybe just uh, as you flourished as an artist and had your new way of expressing yourself healthy, like, like I, that's how I'm just going off of what I would have experienced that when I became more comfortable with how I was able to ex- express myself in, in my way that I felt more extroverted. I felt more comfortable. So maybe it's more uh, just like people need to find their language. And then once they find their language, then they can feel okay communicating it. They're not so self-conscious because maybe everybody's self-conscious and some people just find out that they're really good at talking early on and you were better at art. So maybe that's what helped you feel comfortable communicating. Maybe, I don't know. (laughs) Oh no, I like that because I feel like I was, I had a lot of stories and ideas and conceptions about me as a person. And I think the story of, oh, I'm a shy person who doesn't like being the center of attention. I think that was a very predominant narrative. And as I get older and, and like you said, more comfortable with expressing myself, I'm realizing more and more that, oh, no, actually, I really love um, sharing myself in a very public way. I have situations where I love being um, center stage, having all my eyes on me. And so... And also with the whole introvert story, I thought that I was very risk adverse and not wanting to take chances and not being assertive. And in hindsight, I'm realizing more and more that, oh, all those, a lot of those personality traits were insecurities and depression. <laughs> right. Of course. Of course. And, and I mean, you're clearly not risk adverse because 
being a professional artist and, you know, seeming like you kind of knew earlier on that you were going to do that, I mean, that's a tremendous risk. And a lot of people would consider that an inadvisable life choice to make. Right. <laughs> Out of all the life choices, you've chosen one of the riskiest ones to do. So Exactly. So that, yeah, that narrative was a false narrative. But pro- like, at least for me, I'm speaking only for me, but when I was younger, I I felt kind of a similar way, but that that's... And, and when doing the artwork or um, writing or making movies or anything like that, it felt like it was all about risk and that, that feeling of going somewhere where you haven't been before was actually the draw of the whole thing. So, oh my gosh, yes. I agree yeah. completely. <laughs> but, and I was wondering, uh, the reason why I was asking about your, if it was you were naturally felt introverted or it was an external environmental thing is because also you're a Japanese woman. Yes, I am. I'm a, I'm a half <laughs> Japanese man. But growing up, there was definitely, I was seen by everybody as Japanese. Um, so I, but also not really accepted by Asian kids at my school, mm-hmm. but also very clearly not white by the white kids at my school. I had a diverse, diverse friend group. I wasn't saying I was um, exercised from any of those groups, but I did feel the feeling of otherness. Then, then the narrative of introversion kind of came in my head and then I've self-dogmatized myself. And I feel like a lot of Asian kids did that. And I think that's why there's like this, there's this weird additional cultural narrative of like, uh, of excelling at these, you know, intellectual or artistic endeavors at at like the stereotype for Asian kids because they're weirdly the culture that their parents came from, but also ostracized from the other kids in a weird way. So they are forced into this lane. So that's why I was asking that. I don't know if that's true. That's just how I felt when I was a kid. Oh, no, I I relate to a lot of the things that you bring up. I think as a second generation Japanese American woman, um, the cultural values of not making too much noise, not drawing attention to yourself, uh, fitting in as much as possible, those were seen as desirable things. And so I think having that cultural expectation overlaid on top of being introverted and very shy as a kid, that was an extra layer of, I think, external binding that took a long time for me to recontextualize and question and ultimately reject. Right. Did you, when you were young, were your parents uh, attempting to Americanize or were they very much Japanese in America? That's a good question, Justin. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I, I think, oh geez. Um, they were both certainly very Japanese. Um, but I think they also wanted me to excel in, I, I, I don't, well, (laughs) I will say with my parents, um, they had a lot of, they were very Japanese. Um, but at the same time, I think because they both, chose to break the pattern of their own family history to move to America. I think at the same time, they also, whether consciously or not, they were rebels in their own way. And so to their credit, they never discouraged me in exploring art. Um, They were very proud of me when I got accolades for my writing or my drawings. Um, And and actually, I think (laughs) I had a choice to go to the high school in my district, but a lot of my friends in middle school wanted to go to this more competitive math and science magnet program. And it was actually my choice of... (laughs) wanting to go to this more academically competitive school and and also which was a very prominent Asian American an Asian American heavy uh population and 
I also remember when the SATs were a thing for kids to worry about. I actually had to ask my parents to enroll me in SAT school. So, so culturally they were Japanese, but there were other areas where I'm just so grateful that they weren't the stereotypical tiger mom, tiger dad, um, East Asian parents where I feel like I actually inflicted the academic pressure on myself because I saw other Asian kids around me doing that. So that was really interesting. Hmm. Were you good at school? I I was good at school. I um, it was a badge of honor for me to get almost straight A's and to have a high SAT score. <laughs> wow! Congratulations! Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it means a lot when you're a kid. I was terrible at school. <laughs> it was a it was a huge. Uh, well, no, it was. A, I wouldn't say it was huge. It was a weird uh, badge of uh, honor and shame that I was bad at school, I felt like. But that's interesting. So did you always ad- identify very Japanese growing up? Yes and no. I went to Japanese language school growing up on Saturdays. And this wasn't a casual thing you went to for a few hours. It was intense. So from kindergarten up to um, my freshman year of high school, I went to this Saturday school that was a full school day. It was from nine to three. And I wasn't learning Japanese per se. I was learning subjects in Japanese. So math, science, history, literature. (laughs) And I had homework and it was, and so in that realm, I was terrible. So I was a terrible student in Japanese school. I, I didn't do my homework. I never participated in class. I felt like I didn't really fit in with the other Japanese school kids. And I felt like there was a weird hierarchy in the Japanese language schools where I think the kids who came from Japan, who were more Japanese, because they were from Japan, they were born in Japan, I felt like they were like the cooler kids. And then like the kids who weren't as fluent in Japanese, they weren't as cool. And so I felt I felt like I wasn't Japanese enough. And I felt like my fluency of Japanese wasn't and still isn't as good as my fluency in English. And so I felt like that's something I still struggle with, where I feel like I, I'm sort of split, where I'm very, a lot of my fluency in English is the source of pride for me because I've been able to become a published author and write write things that I share with people. But with my Japanese, I'm very... I guess I'm still kind of ashamed that I don't, I'm not so fluent in Japanese. And so I think that's sort of like a sore tender point in my psyche that I'm still working, working out. That was, that answered my second question, which was how fluent are you in Japanese? Do you ever think in Japanese? Because I, I, I notice in when, if there's a bilingual artist that their compositions seem different to me. Like I, I, I was never sure if that was something I was just projecting or that if there's, because fundamentally lang- languages are hold langu- uh, hold meaning and, and different levels of meaning as a vehicle differently, that, that that would change the way their brain thought about composition and pictorial language as well. But um, if you're not that fluent in Japanese, maybe that's not something that you... Your, that uh, addresses your composition at all. Maybe that's, I don't know. Um, does Do you ever feel like you sp- think in Japanese at all? I sometimes do. I sometimes have dreams in Japanese. And mm. I feel like when I'm in moments of extreme distress, I find myself thinking Japanese thoughts oh, in a con- consoling way. Wow. Um, I, and, I, and I speak well enough to... Uh, I have conversational fluency, so if I if I get stranded in Japan, I won't have a problem speaking to people and surviving. Um, and and I have just like enough rudimentary 
reading, writing skills to get by. Um, but I, I can't say read through a newspaper or read through a novel, which which I would really love to do one day. Yeah, I mean, when, when I, I, I want to back up a little bit, too, to the dream part of it, because that's interesting to me, because your work always has this feeling of uh, dream logic in a weird way, too, or, you know, maybe somewhat psychedelic in a, in a, in a way, <laughs> you know. I don't know how much of that is truly from uh, a, a psychedelic influence or if it's dream state or purely Im- uh, imagination, but there definitely feels like there's some kind of influence from dream, the dream state. Is that is that an accurate reading, or am I just making that up? <laughs> I I've only taken psychedelics once, um, and so, and I was already drawing in that way before I had my first psychedelic experience. So I think it is more from I think a stream of conscious dream logic. How does your art and healing practice overlap? I think with a, pretty much all my art, it is very autobiographical in the sense that it is capturing something I'm working through internally. And then I see it as it's an excavation process or um, a term that I played around with last year was a deep sea pearl diver. So diving in the depths of my psyche, going to the really, really dark places, um, seeing what comes up and then being able to share what comes up with other people. If I'm able to walk through the fire of my deepest insecurities, my deepest pain, really difficult things, whether it's mental illness or family dynamics or past problematic relationships and able to, and if I'm able to articulate to myself what the narrative is or rather what I can extract from those experiences in a way that is empowering or at least brings clarity, then I think the second part of the healing process is then being able to articulate that in a clear way that I could share with other people so that it brings clarity to other people going through similar things. That's very generous of you to do something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I mean, I mean, it sounds like it's it's, you know, at least it started out when you were young as like some kind of probably therapeutic thing, you know, or some kind of therapeutic compulsion. And then making it public is kind of like a, it's a harder thing to do, I feel like, especially for the sake of healing, especially uh, when you're doing these meditations and things like that. Like where, where's, where's that coming from for you? Like, what are you, what are you trying? Are you just trying to share the the process of meditation for other people or are you trying to bring them into your artistic world or like what, what is your, what's the impetus for that? Well, with meditation, I, I discovered it when I was a year out of art school, I was working abroad in Japan and it was, I was teaching English conversational English in an after school program. And it was really it was a mind fuck in the sense that I had to pretend that I couldn't speak Japanese for these students because they were very strict about having. Yeah, I, I agree with that facial expression of confusion. I, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand. Where they, they were really strict about having um, an English language only environment. Um, and so a lot of teachers from America or Canada, they, they would come to teach for this company. And. And so I had to pretend that I didn't speak Japanese. I had to go by my Americanized middle name, Christina. Um, And I was also living with my uh, grandparents and this rural part of the Chiba prefecture. And and so, and also I was really terrible at teaching. Um, Right now I have confidence. Why did you do that? Why did you do that? (laughs) Well, I I felt like as... um, someone graduating with an art degree. I had no idea what to do with my life. And so I I felt this pull towards 
spending a year in Japan, I thought it was going to be this one year, sort of like a post-college gap year where I could just get more clarity on what I should do next. And at that time, I thought, oh, maybe I need to um, get an MFA in illustration. Oh, and man. I'm really glad I didn't do that. I'm glad you didn't either. <laughs> Seems like a waste of time. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, um, I agree, um, at least for myself. And and so I thought also I thought going to Japan would be a great way to get in touch with my roots and all of that. And it. It was certainly a very. Challenging experience (laughs) in the sense that I I was diagnosed with depression my freshman year of college and then once I was in Japan I didn't have access to medication or therapy or my usual support group and so I was very very depressed and it was during that time that I very serendipitously came across David Lynch's book on meditation oh TM Yes, catching the big fish. Um, I, I've never done transcendental meditation, but but he talks about how meditation helped him with his own creative process. And I also read um, Eckhart Tolle's book, A New Earth, which is all about anchoring to the present moment. And so I felt like because I didn't have access to anything else, I just threw myself into meditation because I didn't know what else I could do for my mental health. And and I think from there, it just led to a new art practice where I was making drawings about my meditation experience, which uh, very serendipitously after college led me to work for Deepak Chopra's daughter <laughs> for this internet startup company that she started. Weird. Um, I know, <laughs> so random. So um, and, and I saw through working for this company and just seeing what was out there in a self-help world that for all the material that there was about meditation, there really wasn't really anything that captured meditation in a visual way that was easy for people to understand. And so I saw this gap that was very clearly missing. And since meditation helped me so much with my own mental health and wellness and a sense of mental clarity and creative intuition, I felt I felt compelled to share it because it gave me pleasure to draw and write about it and also to share it with other people. And from there, it just sort of snowballed into Tumblr posts that got a lot of attention and a meditation zine that got sold in bookstores, which then eventually led to two published books about meditation. Did you ever see uh, the act of drawing itself as meditative? Is there any overlap there, do you think, or writing or that like because I've always thought that like the cre- like creative processes like that where you attempt to get in this zone and you like create this feedback loop in your brain of like analyzing and then looking or uh, looking at the paper and then putting it down and then analyzing that and then you know there's constantly regurgitating and reeating what your your own ideas it feels like a very like connected thing like you're connecting to something deep in there do you find that to be meditative in itself or those are two separate practices i feel like it wasn't until recently that i'm relearning how to have more fun with the creative process (laughs) oh that makes sense i mean i don't really find it that fun either (laughs) i don't i can't I like when I tell like when I don't do something it uh like I don't do art or anything like that for a while I start getting really odd like uh like uh my pit bull needs to run every day or she starts like freaking out. Aww. That feels like the same way to me. I, I wouldn't say it's fun. It feels fun when you're in the zone and you you feel like you're doing something that is your life's purpose and that feels transcendent of fun. Absolutely. But it doesn't, it's not like I'm like going to go like hang out with my buddies and drink and like draw and <laughs> yeah. stuff like that. I always like that. I was so jealous of people who thought it was like fun to me. I thought it was like so weird. But yeah, I just like the idea. I, I just have to do something and complete it. And then I'll just, and then halfway through it, I'm already on to the next thing. And I don't know if that's healthy or not. It just feels natural. So I relate to you not <laughs> I'm understanding the fun part of it till recently. How is it fun now? How did you crack the code? Like, what are you doing that you can teach me? 
I'm so glad you bring that up because I think so much of the creative process, it's like jogging. You just have to show up. It's like training. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you want to or not, you have to set aside the time. And sometimes it really sucks. And every so often you get those transcendent experiences of flow, which helps you through the next wave of shittiness where you feel like you don't know what's happening. Um, So I... I really recommend for working artists who love self-help like I do, um, or even if you're not into self-help, an experimental thing. So Julia Cameron, who wrote the book The Artist's Way, which a lot of people love if they haven't given themselves permission to do creative work. She has another book called The Vein of Gold, which I think is geared more towards artists who are already doing the work, but they need additional inspiration and lubrication to sort of induce the flow state. So she she has all these really great exercises that's about so so her so her thesis is that every artist has their own very particular vein of gold. Um, something, a very specific wavelength of emotion or themes that they're very good at. And once you find that, it's it's much easier for you then to find work, to create work that's meaningful for you that's also going to resonate with other people. So she makes you go do these Really fun exercises like, oh, make visual collages about your childhood, make a mask, um, make clay figurines. <laughs> like and, arts and crafts. Yeah. And I sort of fell off the workbook. I, I did it uh, last year and I sort of fell off the bandwagon. Um, but some of the last exercises involved like... Oh, making making a lullaby for yourself. Um, it, yeah, like really, really weird, cool stuff that sort of that just takes you out of your usual art practice, which I think just reintroduced to me how playful art can be. Like, um, just like that, like being a kid where you're not thinking about your art career or your social image or what how this fits into the trajectory of the art career that you want where you're just expressing yourself for the sake of expressing yourself and so yeah but is that fun (laughs) to me like (laughs) when i'm thinking like when you're saying like uh, getting out the out of the place of thinking about your career and stuff when when i'm doing something i'm i guess i'm asking for selfish reasons now because i want to understand what you're talking about (laughs) but like for me like i just have to do it or I, it's just like almost like keeping myself balanced. You know, I know the work is good, but it doesn't feel like the same as fun. You know, like, oh, I know I agree. It's not playful for me. <laughs> like I'm like almost v- too serious about it, you know, like, and like, I know that I, I know the work's good. So that's not the problem. It's just that I have to, I just have to, like, it's almost uh, just purely compulsion to do it. Do you, you feel that same way then? I do. And I think, I think that's why it's important for me to have to have a secret passion project that doesn't have an end goal. Ah, that's what I do. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> Even that's not fun, though. I mean, it just, yeah, it just feels like my life. It's like less work, miserable. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not always fun. Um, but I, I feel like so. So I feel like my sort of fun um oh no i want to say i'm having fun um yeah is my little like side project that is just for fun is my mindful dating series that i'm posting on my instagram stories where that's not going to become a book don't say it if it is <laughs> you we can cut this out but i think that should be that is fucking awesome Thank you. Um, and for people who don't have, who don't know what it is, uh, so on my Instagram stories, the origin of this is that two years ago on Facebook, just for fun, I wondered out loud, oh, should I write a book on online dating, but like a mindfulness book on online dating? And it just struck a chord with people. Like so many people are like, oh my God, please write this book. And at the time, I'd only gone on maybe two online dates, and I 
was so bored by both of them. I was like, I don't want to date, so I can't write this book. (laughs) Um, But then two years later, I I went on more online dates, and I think, and then I sort of mentioned it again, sort of playfully on my Instagram stories, like, oh, two years ago, I had this book idea, ha ha, and maybe I should, like, just post about it on Insta stories, and and so I just started doing it and not knowing where this direction was going to go to where it was just my own riff on dating and how mindfulness can make this process of online dating a little more bearable since people seem to universally hate it. And it took on a life of its own and I like to post it without overthinking it and people seem to really respond to it. So yeah. that's been really fun for me. <laughs> and you're very prolific. I mean, I think those things are either every time I read them I think they're either funny or playful or profound you know I think I think it's very good very very in line with the rest of your books which apparently are not fun for you to do but (laughs) they seem very fun (laughs) you know like even the fashion forecast of the future seems very fun there's like this very comedic element to them you know this kind of fantastical element to me anyways that's what they feel like they're they're easy to get through because you can look at any of the images and see the imagination and feel the playfulness, but also feel the a little bit more, I don't want to say darker parts of it, but they're coming from somewhere that feels equally light and dark, I guess, in a weird way that like people who are searching for spiritualism seem to have, you know? Yeah, that's my jam. I like to use humor <laughs> as a Trojan horse to bring in the dark stuff. Bring in the you dark figured stuff. me out, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm the opposite. I just I Trojan horse on pure darkness, <laughs> and, then, and then and then you get more darkness. Um, but that's interesting. So um, uh, you don't have to tell tell us what it's about. But are you working on a book now? Something new that you're going to present to the world? I am working on a new book, um, <laughs> and it's I'm really excited because I feel like visually. It's going to look, well, I wouldn't say it will look that different, but I, I, I feel like visually it will be very distinctly a new era hmm. compared to what I've been doing before. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I look forward to seeing that. I mean, is there any other big projects you're working on now that you're excited about? Like, I know like you last, not last time we spoke, but uh, you had told me about some uh, Smithsonian show you had been doing. Right, right. That was based on the future forecasts. Oh yeah, that was um, that was back in 2016. Oh wow, ancient history now. <laughs> I know it feels <laughs> wow. like ages ago. Wow, but you're so prolific now. Have you? I mean, that was that book came out in 2016. I, I saw the reading that came out only last year, didn't it? Oh, so uh, fashion forecasts. It was originally an installation, an art scene that I did for the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center in 2016. And then the curator was interested in bringing back the art scene as a more expanded art book. And so that book came out in 2018. Oh, got it, got it, got it. So is that something that you have more plans to do in the future, more of the installation stuff? Is that something you've had more of a past in outside the books as well? Or um, was that just a one-off situation? I feel like with installations, they just sort of, the opportunities just sort of pop up when they need to. I'm not necessarily consciously seeking out installation opportunities. But if they happen to come my way and it fits with what I'm thinking about, then I'm, I'm at least open to it. It's like a very, it was like a specifically Asian show then? So it was predominantly uh, Asian American, but also with an intersectional lens. So there were also other artists of color who were not Asian American Pacific Islander who also who were also part of the show. So there are also Black artists and Native American artists. So where, how do you feel like you fit in that whole world, like the a- Asian American artist? Is that something that's important to you as part of your identity? Or just something that's kind of happened because you were born a certain way, because people projecting that? Or how do you see your place in that conversation? That's a good question, Justin. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, two. I got two so far. I mean, they're all good questions. I say that's a good question as a way to... 
to think about to it. To think about <laughs> yeah. it. Um, uh, an ex-partner once pointed that verbal tick out to me when I was doing a reading. Um, it is important to me, um, especially since I think a lot of Asian American women go, going back to sort of the cultural expectations and narratives that we talked about earlier, I think Asian Asian women in particular are pressured to not speak up and to to fit in with cultural expectations and I think to ha- and they're dealing with American patriarchy in tandem with Asian patriarchy. <laughs> Very intense patriarchy. Yeah, and so and so I I feel it's important for me to to be a very vocal presence and to not, even though my art is not always consciously Asian American, I think it is important for me to claim that identity that, oh, I am an Asian American artist and I am very consciously wanting to change the narratives around Asian American artists, Asian Americans in general, and to bring more visibility and, um, narrative agency to to the to the community what do you think those narratives are that you're trying to change um i think well i think i think the first thing is that um i feel like a lot of asian americans don't feel like they have their own narrative space and culture so uh, i mean i certainly that is changing bit by bit with say movies like Crazy Rich Asians and just seeing more Asian Americans in TV and film but I feel like I feel like Asian Americans just have a weird place in the conversation around race and ethnicity and those dynamics in American society um and so I I just want to see more Asian Americans give themselves permission to have their own creative space and voice. That's not about conforming to the dominant narrative. Do you think that um, Asian culture, Asian American culture, and especially Asian women in the culture of America are fetishized in a weird way, openly? Oh, totally. Yeah. Uh, Oh, I agree. (laughs) Completely. I thought I, I thought it was so strange to me. I'm not an Asian American woman, but I've there's been several occasions when people have come up to me and said told me that they were a fan of my work because they were Japanophiles. What? And I was like I was like I found that to be so weird and if, like I was not even offended because I thought it was so strange. But I thought about it and I I mean I just I couldn't I couldn't be offended because I know they didn't mean anything by it except that the culture and system that they they are in feels like that's an okay thing to say to somebody. But I know that they're trying to be nice, but I found it to be so odd that they felt okay saying that, you know? Like, because being a Japanophile, what does that mean? Yeah, what does that mean? It just means they <laughs> fetishize this culture that they think you have because they looked at you and decided that's what you are. Right. For me, I've got this, I'm basically what am I fourth generation my my mom was 100% Japanese but she was third generation her parents met in the camps so they um in Minidoka and so they have this ultra americanization that she they forced upon her and then later on in her life she she didn't even know she was Japanese when she was a kid until someone wow. called her a slur right oh like my they know she was Japanese till they called her a Jap like the kids when she was like whatever, uh, however old in grade school. And so she went through this whole situation of trying to regain her culture in a, in a strange, not in a strange way, but her in, in the sense that it was erased. Like her parents don't even speak Japanese and they're 100% Japanese, not because they didn't know how, but because they didn't want their kids to right. hear Japanese. They mm-hmm. were American because there's a sense of shame forced on them because of the camps. And now, like, you know, she's like this uh, Japanese, she sees herself and is seen by other people as this Japanese-American woman artist and very 
you know, prominent, but she, uh, she wasn't always that way, you know? And I think because she's seen as Japanese minus the Japanese American complexity, you know, have that somewhat whitewashing of the culture and then the forceful act to try to regain the culture. Um, and the, and the fact that like anime and like, uh, Japanese pop music and all these things are deeply influential in American culture, but minus in a weird way, the people who are part of it, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, that it's, it's like, it's just kind of strange. And I was, I'm, I was part of the reason I was interested in talking to you is because I'm a fan of your work, but also that extra layer of complexity that I'm aware happens in being who we are and being, I guess you'd be more similar to my mom who was a Japanese American woman who became this artist and again, fighting against norms there, but while also having this fetishized idea of who she was forced upon her, which I find interesting. <laughs> so that's why I was curious about asking how you felt about your place in that culture. Why is it important? Do you feel this tension because of it? And, um, and what are you going to do about it, Yumi? <laughs> what are you going to do to change people's thinking? What am I going to do about it? Um, I think I made a conscious decision a few years ago that if I want to see more Asian American women artists be very visible in the media, then I have to live up to my own expectation of that. Sure. And so I've been consciously... I think before I was very comfortable with just hiding behind my work. Like, oh, these are my drawings. You don't have to know me as a person. You could just enjoy my drawings and my art and we don't have to interface. Um, and nowadays I'm much more conscious about, for example, if I'm on a panel to really speak up, to really embrace the fact that I am a public figure as a published author and to to embrace opportunities like this podcast interview and um, having interviews. And so I feel like it is about, for me, at the end of the day, the, the most that I can do is to keep making meaningful art that resonates with me and, sh and be shameless and sharing it with as many people as possible. Um, I think that's a very inspiring and good strategy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> how, um, how, um, moving back to a darker subject again. Let's do it. I want to talk more about your depression as well, if that's okay. Yeah, that's always okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do you find a help, uh, talking about it helps you or do you think that, that, that do you kind of exercise demons through the work? Is that an active thing you're trying to do? I, I love talking about it now that I'm out of sort of the the deepest darkest depths of it especially since there is still a stigma around mental illness um especially in the asian american community so so i i find it empowering to talk about it as much as possible and to and to continue to create work that deals with the roots of deep emotional pain hmm. do you do, can you do you think that is coming from something natural is there something that you can pinpoint as something that helps you cope with something like that or is it just therapy medication or there's different things that work for you specifically oh with my depression yes so it's it's changed over the years I think when I was a freshman in college I needed medication and weekly therapy appointments um Nowadays, I am still on medication. I don't see a therapist regularly. Um, I exercise and I consciously schedule time with friends, not as a leftover thing of like, oh, I'll, I'll see friends when I have time. It's, it's a conscious and deliberate part of my schedule that I need to honor. And also, also I think so much of mental health management is having strong boundaries and learning how to say no to things and not being not being ashamed or hard on yourself when you need to cancel on plans or say no to people especially to your friends and family um and so it's it's an ongoing 
It, it's like having an ecosystem and... I use that all the time. <laughs> yes. Like, really cool. I'm glad, yeah, I'm so I think that. your mental health is an ecosystem or it's it's not just medication. It's not just therapy. It's it's a bunch of different different conscious decisions you're making in different aspects of your life. So eating healthy, exercising, medication, meditation, um, honoring your creative practice, having good friends, but also having time for yourself, um, scheduling in fun things to do it's 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 a bunch of different things at once that's going to i think keep your mental health in a good place hmm. i always i always think too because um i i should probably like go and investigate this a bit more but i feel like i have like i get tremendously dark like and i it's not been uh diagnosed as meditation but um i or not meditation as depression <laughs> but i feel like it's definitely that like everybody on my mom's side of the family se- seems to have something like that oh that's so interesting it reminds me of how in korean culture there's the idea of the han right yeah that, I, that, that yeah that anger that that <laughs> epigenetic anger or something like and that and i feel like there really isn't a japanese word for it I don't know. Maybe because all Japanese people have. It. I feel I feel like I have it. That's why that's why I have this like weird yeah, I mean it seems so like stereotypical too that like I just need to stereotypically Japanese to like need to like perfect certain things or like have like craft um be a part of like the whole wellness thing to like concentrate myself, which is why my mom became a weaver is like that she needed something to focus on and she became a much healthier person because of it but do you think that has anything to do with like the the idea of meditation and and the craft that you do the art that you do that work do you think um there's any root cause um in it having to do with fractured focus of modern day living (laughs) i'm being serious i'm being totally serious because like meditation things like that they do seem to work like without Med- medication, uh, um, I'm, I mean, I'm no doctor at all, but like for me, just pure focus seems to be the thing that was like the, the root of like mental health, like giving that time to do that. I, that makes sense. I feel like I, I definitely thrive mentally when I have daily rituals and practice in place. Right. And so I do 20 minutes of meditation. I do this practice called the morning pages, which is three handwritten pages of stream of conscious writing. And I always have at least at least two hours of concentrated brainstorming time where it's not the goal is not so much getting something done, but just giving my brain permission to to really brainstorm and free flow with ideas and concepts. And so, and I definitely do feel a lot better mentally when I have a project to work on, uh, an end goal, a deadline that I'm working towards. So, so yeah, I think that's, that is another aspect of how creativity mentally grounds you. Um, it does, I think, yeah, I never thought of that. I never thought about it in the way that you asked, but it does make sense that in this fractured modern world where we have so many distractions, I think that focused time container of clarity where you're not on your phone, you're not on multiple browsers, you're not reading the news, you're really focusing on a very specific activity or movement or expression, I think that is very important. And I think that is a way um, both for artists and for non-professional creative people. I think that is an important thing that we can all gift ourselves. Mm. I, I, I've been thinking about this a lot. And like I said, I'm no expert on anything. It's just simply trying to self-diagnose myself and then see patterns. But I would, I, I, I've noticed this weird thing that like there's definitely this kind of surge of, 
like the 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 modern creative and everybody's creative and like everybody's with Instagram and all these things that are both simultaneously distracting also like a set, a source of expression and creativity and then people also seem to there there's like a mindful meditation is quote unquote trending and ambient right. ambient music is is popular now and all these things and like making like kids making slime and like oddly satisfying things there's this uptick in all this stuff as the world gets more insane and like there's and and just artists in general seem to have a sort of mental health and balance typically and i wonder if they found art early on and became artists and this uh one because they're sensitive people two because um the act of expressing like you're expressing like a, a cyst or something gives relief <laughs> like gives relief and then focus all those things are in tune with each other and i always feel like it's at least the impetus of becoming an artist has to do with mental therapy and then because of that they get some kind of validation from their peers and that gives them social value so they are not only expressing themselves with through therapy but also now that they they have some kind of social value that they can give other people that seems to be in everybody I've talked to has it would appear that that's at least part of the root of why they've become what they've become so it would only stand as some kind of logical thing to me that as people like there's this attraction to being an artist and everybody's creative and there's these ways of like focusing and uh, blocking things out that 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 has to have something to do with that focus is uh, like should be that should be uh, like prescribed to people <laughs> like yeah you know? like, yeah yeah so i don't know that's just what i'm thinking like like, why are all these things trending now that uh, that everything has gotten so fucking out of control and out of whack? People are drawn to this hyper-focused and uh, almost the artist mentality and mindfulness. Mindfulness is just focus, really. It really is. And, yeah, maybe we need therapists who are like, oh, here's medication and also a basket weaving class that you have to yeah, do. Yeah, something, for. you know. That, yeah. Maybe if I was a doctor and I'm not, <laughs> that's what I would prescribe because that seems to be the thing that helps people, you know, or I mean, artists, I mean, sometimes that's not even enough, unfortunately, but it would, it would, it would stand to reason that it would at least help deriving your social validation through as a byproduct of your focus seems like that just kills two birds with one stone and also creates good art. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, I feel so efficient. You're very efficient. <laughs> and you and you also teach meditation, so it's all kind of feeding the same thing. Yeah. Maybe. Thanks for the ego boost, Justin. You're, I mean, I mean, I <laughs> I'm just I was talking to you while trying to ma like figure out my own self. So you were a mirror for that, so thank you. <laughs> Anytime. <Yeah. laughs> Seems like a good enough place to stop it. So Thank you so much for uh, for being here. Do you have anything you have coming up that you'd like to promote? I will just say, just keep... Um, I'm most active on my Instagram stories these days, and that's where I tend to do sneaky sneak previews of upcoming things. So uh, I see. Just stay tuned over there, and news will be revealed as they come. What's the uh, What's your handle? It is at Yumi Sakugawa. So my first and last name, no space or dashes. One Great. word. Great. Thank you for being here today. I appreciate the conversation. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Music for the podcast is by Rarebit, a.k.a. Justin Joshua Hopkins. Editing assistant is Matthew Apol.